Today on Ask This Old House. These light switches don't match the character of the house. And this dimmer is upside down. But I have a solution for that. Wait a second. He, does that say up? It does. <laughs> so all we had to do is just flip it around? Turn it around. And in Future House, I'll see how geothermal is becoming more affordable for the average homeowner. You're basically hammering the ground at 9,000 times a minute, which allows the ground to actually vibrate so fast that it actually becomes like a jello which allows you guys to drill through the earth so quickly. Correct. And that lets you get in and out of the job much faster. Yes. Hi there, I'm Kevin O'Connor and welcome back to Ask This Old House where we would love to hear from you if you've got a question about your house. Keep those questions coming because we have got the experts with the answers. So what's the difference on that one? That's just a straight uh, flippy up and down toggle one. <laughs> it's a toggle switch. Toggles, yeah, a three-way so, toggle yeah. switch when you have so multiple know, locations. So I know this one. This is the spinner. What's Not going on here? What's different. going on? We'll learn about switches. I'm Learning? getting all the technical names. Flippy, spinner? Oh, we're giving him a little crash course. <laughs> oh, for three, I think. Heath, don't be uh, bogged down with this guy. You are up first. What are you working on? So today we're looking at replacing a light switch, uh, trying to replicate an antique one that a homeowner has in their home. Cool. All right. Well, grab your stuff and uh, get going. I'll get going. Richard, how about you? What do you got? Nothing. Oh, you should be able to handle that. <laughs> I got a loose day. You might want to talk to my son, Ross. He's got something going. The good for theory. Yeah, that's right. I will. Hey, Ross. Hey, Kev. What are you working on? I've got a future house on geothermal. Oh, cool. Well, you know I love geo. You do. You I must do. have a near house, right? Oh, no. Way too expensive. <laughs> I agree with you. That large upfront cost, it's really why it hasn't reached that mass adoption. I mean, what a great idea, right? Consistent temperature in the ground. Use that. But it's so expensive to get going. And I think it scares a lot of people. Well, I'm headed to upstate New York to hopefully find ways to make geothermal more affordable to more homeowners. Well, I'm definitely going to tune in for that. All right. Hi, Jane. Hey, Heath. Thanks so much for stopping by. Oh, nice to meet you. You have a beautiful home. Yeah, thanks. It's a 1920s duplex. My husband and I live on the first floor. Uh, I'd love to invite you in and take a look at the light switch. Sounds good. Let's take a look. So Heath, this is our living room with the light fixture that I told you about. Mm -hmm. When we bought the house two years ago, uh, there was no overhead lighting. Okay. So my husband installed the ceiling fan with the light, and then this is the switch for it. Not crazy about and it. Not crazy about the switch? Well, the first thing I can tell looking at it is it looks like it's upside down. The switch is upside down? And the switch is upside down. Oh, geez. And the way to tell this is typically this dimmer would have the slide on the right side and not the left. And when you go to use it, you might have noticed that when you push it up, it actually dims down on the slider. And when you push the slider down, it actually raises the light fixture. Yeah, it doesn't totally make sense. Yeah. So well, let's take a look and see how it operates. It looks like it doesn't work too well for what we're looking at either. It's not the best. Let's see what we have for a light fixture. So the good news is you have a dedicated LED fixture, which means it'll last a really long time and it's really energy efficient. And that helps us with this issue as well. That probably means this isn't an LED compatible dimmer, which is an easy enough fix. Okay. So one of the things I want to ask you about is in my son's room, we have one of the original switches. It's a push button. Okay. Can I show you that and see if it might work in here? Absolutely. Let's take a look. Okay. So here's Wesley's room. Okay. Oh, and here's our light switch. And these are beautiful switches. You don't see these too often anymore. They used to have these beautiful mother of pearl inlays into them, the brass plates. They're really, really nice. Let me kind of give you an idea of how these work. Normally, we'd send the power wire to one screw, the load wire, in this case, the light fixture to the other screw, the ground on this guy. And if you look inside the switch where we cut it, you can see two tabs that are separated. When we turn the switch on, the two tabs make contact, let power go to the light fixture to turn the light on. When you turn it off, it breaks the tabs, no power to the light fixture. Like you said, these are really beautiful lights, but why aren't they used anymore? A couple of reasons we've heard. One, a little the noise. Loud. A little loud. Uh, and the second thing is the materials to make these were a little more expensive. So as the general toggle switch became more popular, less expensive to make, it was more common to use. The good news is for you, though, they do make an LED dimmer that looks like this style that is compatible to work in your living room. Great. Let's do it. All right. Before I do any work, I want to turn the power off down at the panel and then we can remove the switches. So first, we're gonna take the screws out of the plate.
Now you can watch this old house and ask this old house anytime, anywhere. Download our new app to stream full episodes to your tablet, your TV, and your phone. Binge on classic episodes, catch up on recent renovations, and get step-by-step -step help projects all around the house. And best of all, it's free. The most trusted home improvement information is now available on your Amazon Fire TV, Roku, Apple TV, iOS, and Android devices. Download the This Old House streaming app today. Wait a second. He, does that say up? It does. So all we had to do is just flip it around? That's it. This is the single switch that controls the lamp on the other side of the room. So we're going to take the feed wire off first. The dimmer is the one we're going to be replacing that goes to the LED light on the ceiling fan. And lastly, we'll take the ground wire off. All right. So let me show you what we found for a new switch. This is a reproduction push button to match what you have in the other bedroom. The good thing is this reproduction matches all of today's modern safety standards and gives us the same look that you have over there that we're looking for. Love it. Then for the dimmer, a little different with the same kind of look, the top pushes in out the toggle the light on. The bottom dial is the actual dimmer. The one thing I did notice though is we do want to add a second ground wire. There wasn't one that went to the other device. So we're going to put one for this switch, one for the other switch, and then we can install the devices. Okay. So we're going to trim that off flush, and then we're just going to reinstall a wire nut to hold all of the grounds together. And tuck that right in the back of the box. And now we're ready to install the new switches. So first we're going to put the toggle switch in. So we want the hook to wrap around the switch clockwise. Then we'll pinch that together to give us a nice closed loop. And that way when we tighten it, it'll draw that wire together and keep it nice and snug. Next we'll go to the red wire, in this case that goes to the receptacle that controls the lamp. And with this particular switch, it's designed for the wire to slide into here. And the screw actually acts as a clamp internally. So instead of wrapping it around like we normally would, that clamp will hold the wire internally. And we'll do the same for the feed wire. And then in this case, we're going to put a little tape around it because we do have a metal box. For the dimmer, we have pigtails that we're actually going to tie, attach using a wire nut. So we'll start by putting the ground on. Then we'll move to our load wire, in this case, is the LED light fixture. And then finally we'll connect the feed wire. Since we have enough slack on the existing wires, I'm just going to cut off this loop and start with a freshly stripped piece. Now we'll fold the wires into the back of the box. And finally, we'll put our new plate on. All right, the new switches are all in. I love the way it looks. And the breaker is on. Let's give it a try. All right, this is for the lamp? That's for the lamp. Lamp looks great. Success. And now for the new dimmer. Looks good. And there's the dimmer. Perfect. Works. Looks great. Thanks so much, Heath. Thank you. Want to tackle all your home improvement projects with confidence? Join This Old House Insider, a new streaming service from This Old House, the iconic Emmy-winning series that inspired a generation of home enthusiasts. Stream over 1,000 episodes of This Old House and Ask This Old House commercial-free. Watch it all in the This Old House app. And join live online Q&As with our experts. 
Best of all, you can try Insider free for seven days. To join, go to thisoldhousemembership.com. When you're looking for renewable ways to fuel your home, it's hard to beat geothermal heat pumps, at least in theory. Just below our feet, the earth is always at a consistent temperature of about 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Using a looped pipe filled with water or antifreeze, you can tap into that constant temperature. In the summer, that well can be a place to dump excess heat. And in the winter, heat can be pulled out of the ground. That same system can also provide hot water for your showers and your dishes. It's incredibly efficient and requires no fossil fuels. So why isn't geothermal as common as solar or wind? For one thing, drilling a well can get very expensive. Some of it's because you don't know what's below your feet when you start drilling. It could be soft like this, or it could be hard as a rock. It's also typically a messy process that involves big equipment that doesn't fit in every yard. Here on Future House, we've been exploring ways that geothermal has been getting more accessible. I toured a community in Texas that installed geothermal wells before any houses were built. Every home in that neighborhood was connected to the geothermal system, and each house only paid a small portion of the overall costs. But what if you're not moving, or you like the house you live in? Today, I'm headed to Albany, New York, to see the evolution of geothermal that may allow it to get deployed to many, many more houses. Ross, welcome to our drill site. Thomas, thanks for having me. When I think of geothermal though, I am not thinking about established neighborhoods with small lot lines. I mean, I'm thinking usually major renovations, new construction, large projects. This is unique. This used to be the, the case up until now. What we're trying to do is bring geothermal to residential neighborhoods. And to be able to do that, we have to design uh, for modularity and be able to squeeze into really tight spaces. Yeah, when I think of a traditional geothermal rig, I'm not thinking of this something this small. I mean, it's, it's fitting between a tree and the house and a small lot like this. This is, this is compact. Correct. We tried to uh, design to be able to squeeze into really tight spaces. And to be able to do that, we designed uh, the undercarriages to have rubber tracks, gotcha. to be able to rotate 360 degrees gotcha. without churning up the yard. And it also distributes the load so that you don't uh, damage driveways. That's great. All right, so this is the rig. Let me see it. Yeah. So you see how the drill is in place now. The casing is vertical. Mm -hmm. So we're about to commence with sonic drilling, oh. right? And what sonic drilling does is oscillate that casing vertically at up to 150 hertz. And that is 9,000 vertical beats per minute. So if I get a recap here, you're basically hammering the ground at 9,000 times a minute which allows the ground to actually vibrate so fast that it actually becomes like a jello, which allows you guys to drill through the earth so quickly. Correct. And that lets you get in and out of the job much faster. Yes, right now, and we are adding an additional 10 foot of casing okay. to the drill string. And you'll see that we are running 10 foot casing lengths as opposed to 20 foot casing lengths. Right. And that's gonna help us make the entire system more compact. Got it, so if you were using 20 foot casings, this truck would be a lot larger. Exactly. Gotcha. Okay. With this sonic system, we are able to install the casing all the way down to bedrock in 30 minutes. A conventional system could take up to seven hours to install the same diameter casing to the same depth. Wow, that is a significant difference. And they will not be able to extract that casing. Every piece of casing that you see on our pipe handler right now has been used on previous projects. We have not replaced a single set of casing. And that's really unique because most installations that I see, the casing stays in forever. Right, and the purpose of that casing is to prevent collapse of the hole and to retain all of our drilling fluids, which will increase the rate of penetration as a whole for the entire project. This allows us to bring down the cost even further for the ground loop installation. So a six inch casing has made its way down 82 feet, lodged itself into bedrock, and now they're switching to another drill rig. Exactly, and that's going to have a down the hole hammer, uh, which we call the DTH, and it's going to be drilling through the center of this six inch casing all the way to bedrock, and then from bedrock all the way through to the total depth, which is the design depth for this well. This uh, well is going to be a 300 foot well, and this project will have two of those 300 foot wells. Gotcha. While we are drilling, 
you'll see that all of the uh, rock chippings and mud and swale that is uh, excavated from this hole will have to come up the hole and instead of dumping it all on the customer's yard we are transferring that to our mud processing unit and our mud processing unit will be able to separate um, the solids from the liquids and this enables us to recycle the water and reuse this same water over and over again and clean that water to within 30 microns which is about a thousandth of an inch. So I can see the loop rig coming in. I, I see the high density polyethylene pipe being lowered into the, into the borehole. I also see another pipe coming in at the same time. What's that pipe for? That is the coil tubing pipe and that's going to enable us to grout from the bottom up which is an underwater grouting technique. That will become a column that will have really good contact with the earth for really good efficiency. Correct, and this grouting or concreting um, uh, layer around it has two purposes. The first purpose is to conduct heat from the soil to the ground loop, and the second purpose is to ensure that no um, pollution or impurities can actually penetrate the soil towards the aquifers. All right, so now we have completed our drilling, looping, and grouting, which means the geothermal loop has been installed, right? And this will be linked towards the inside of the house. And Brian Zimmerly is uh, uh, inside working on that system right now, and he'll be able to show you all the magic inside. So Brian, I design a lot of geothermal systems and they typically require a custom solution, right? High-end residential. It's you know, it's a different market. So tell me about the innovation, what you guys are working on here. Absolutely, yeah. So one of the steps that we've done right off the bat is standardize a lot of the way that we design and engineer the systems. So we use design software to properly size the unit to make sure the geothermal well is properly sized. And that just helps the overall efficiency of the project. Gotcha. What we've also done is that we're reusing any in existing infrastructure that we can. So in this case, the existing air ducts. Gotcha, okay. Um, and so you can see here we've cut off the existing ducts and added our new system in and just added these flexible duct so connectors. So it's pretty much plug and play, right? Plugging it in here, connecting between the supply and the return. Exactly. So nice. the home used to have an air conditioner outside, natural gas furnace inside. What we've done is pulled that old unit out, coil, condenser, furnace, and we've capped the natural gas lines. And now we've got one single geothermal unitary system. So no more outdoor condenser. No more outdoor condenser, which is great. Yeah, and you'll notice too that one of the things you'll typically see in a geothermal system is a separate uh, pump box mm -hmm. that has your pumps and some of the flushing ports in it. We've put all of that into one unit to make the, the installation process that much faster and smoother. And installing things in a factory is much faster than doing it in the field. Sure. And so what you'll see here, what we've got is two pumps that pump uh, through this piping and out to our geothermal well mm -hmm. and it's pumping a mixture of water and a little bit of glycol just to account for any possible freezing conditions. Okay. And so that water then is moving through a heat exchanger inside the tank or inside the unit yep. that uh, exchanges with the refrigerant that's all self-contained inside the box. Gotcha. So on the air side, I see the return duct coming in here. Exactly. What happens next? Yeah, so this is just like any typical uh, system where you, you're pulling uh, return air across a, a refrigerant coil that the fan is pulling and pushing out through the rest of your existing ductwork. Got it. So in the you know winter time when the air is cold, it's coming in right across that coil, warming up and then being delivered to the supply duct into the space. Exactly. And then it's just a continuous cycle where we're then going back and getting more heat from the ground and pulling it back to your heat That's exchangers. Great. That's great. Awesome. What about the blue piping? Yeah, you'll notice that we've got this extra piping here that this is going over to heat your hot water for things like showers or dishwashing. Okay, so domestic water. Exactly. Okay. So in cases, for example, like the, the summertime where you've got extra heat from the heat pump, mm -hmm. before we send that out to the geothermal well, we can send it into a preheat tank. So this tank here is just like any other water heater, but we've just not connected it to any power. Gotcha. Right? Okay. So the cold water comes in here and we can heat it with that excess geothermal before it goes into your traditional water heater. Got it. Got it. So that's commonly called the superheater preheat tank exactly. connection. Got it. And so your electric water heater doesn't have to work as hard because it's got preheated water. 
Exactly, yeah, and it's basically this, you know, can heat anywhere from 20 to 30 percent of the home's annual domestic hot water use. Okay. It just makes the, the, the primary water heater have to work a little less hard. Yeah, so it's all electric, the whole system? The system is all electric now, which is really great. If you can then pair it up with something like solar on your rooftop, then your home becomes a lot more sustainable. Really exciting. It is exciting. So how many systems have you installed to date? We've installed a couple of hundred, all the way from here in Albany, south along the Hudson River Valley, to just north of New York City. Gotcha. Now, why New York? Yeah, New York for a few reasons. One is there are a few million homes that heat with fuel oil and propane today, and they're going to see the most savings from geothermal. On top of that, New York has generally high energy prices, mm -hmm. and the state provides good incentives for homeowners to choose geothermal today. Gotcha. Now, in a house like the one we just installed in, what's the out-of-pocket expense for that homeowner? Yeah, average out-of-pocket for a home like that would be anywhere from 18000 to 22000 That home coming in around 19000 Okay. Now, that's less expensive than a traditional geothermal system, but that's still really expensive. Yeah, so we're taking a play out of the book of solar, and, you know, a decade or so ago, solar on rooftops was really expensive. And what we're doing is uh, providing financing similar to the way solar did, where we take away that upfront cost. So the homeowner has zero out of pocket on day one, and you replace that with a fixed monthly fee. So they start seeing savings from day one. Gotcha. And what that means is that now they get heating, cooling, and some of their domestic hot water with a, for a fixed monthly rate that's lower than what they would be paying for their utilities otherwise. Gotcha. Yeah. And it should be added that the homeowner owns the geothermal system. It's an asset that they can amortize over the lifetime and that adds value to their real estate. Yeah, that's a great point. I'm a big fan of geothermal, and I'm glad you guys are making it more accessible. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Ross. Thank you. Wow, that is encouraging and interesting to see. I mean, is it possible that this is the breakout moment for geothermal, the one that will make it go mainstream? I mean, it's a huge step in the right direction. You know, historically, you had you know a driller, you had an HVC contractor, you might have a controls contractor. That you know team had to be assembled with them. They They're can. trying to bring it all together into one. You know, right. so. and, and then, of course, the drilling costs, which yeah. was always the biggest right. hurdle. Right. They're starting to attack that, so it's promising. Well, I've been advocating geothermal for a long time, 25, 30 years, but it's been an uphill climb, particularly in New England. By the time you drill down into that granite, it gets really expensive and painful. You know, and what's also happened in the marketplace is these cold weather heat pumps have come along. You know, we, we know that you have a single box outside that can find enough heat even on a zero degree day to right. heat the building. It's hard to argue with that. So it's true. We see these mini splits yeah. all over the place these days. I mean, what do you say to that? Yeah, but you think about ground source heat pumps inherently are always going to be more efficient than an air source, air source counterpart. Because you think about it, the house wants to be 70 degrees and the ground temperature is about 50 degrees. So when I'm heating or cooling, I'm bringing it from 50 to 70. That's a 20 degree delta. Winter or summer, just Winter. 20 degrees. It doesn't matter. But with an air source heat pump, the outdoor temperature when it's really cold out could be zero degrees and I have to bring that up to 70. Or on a hot summer day, it could be 95 or 100 right. degrees. Mm. I got to bring that up. So the delta T is a lot wider with an air source heat pump, so it has to work a lot harder. Yeah, he's the got other, you there. The other thing that's pretty good on the geothermal is it's invisible. You know, you don't see it, you don't hear anything, there's nothing outside. It's like W.C. Fields said about kids, don't see them, don't hear them. <laughs> Did you feel it? Did you feel it? You guys should resolve this over Thanksgiving dinner it's all fun. and report back to us. Exciting news for both of your technologies. All right, well, we'd love to hear from you, so keep your questions coming. And until next time, I'm Kevin O'Connor. I'm Rich Rathui. I'm Ross Rathui. For Ask This Old House. And they do like each other. <laughs> for sure. <laughs>